Shall we get started? All right. Good afternoon. My name is Isaac Weiner, and I'm an associate professor of religious studies in the Department of Comparative Studies at Ohio State University and associate director of OSU's Center for the Study of Religion. It is my great honor to moderate today's panel, featuring a lineup of highly distinguished speakers on a topic that could not be more pressing or timely. On this historic inauguration day, I think we all feel the profound urgency of this moment. A COVID pandemic that has, that has had a disproportionately devastating impact on communities of color in the United States, a protest movement for racial justice catalyzed by yet more instances of state violence against African-American bodies, and the end of a presidential administration that repeatedly exploited and exacerbated our racial divisions. This seems an especially important moment to consider the place of religion and religious institutions in these struggles. Religious institutions and communities have played critical roles in movements for racial justice and civil rights throughout US history, from abolitionism through the civil rights movements of the 1960s. Yet religious organizations have also stood on the other side of these movements, justifying the institution of slavery, supporting structural racism, aligning with white supremacy. Just consider some of the events of the past couple of weeks. I actually agreed to moderate this panel only two weeks ago on Wednesday morning, January 6th. The night before, Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff had won historic runoff elections for Senate seats in the state of Georgia. Warnock is the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, the same pulpit once occupied by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now Senator Warnock's preaching taps into a potent strain of black liberation theology Yet his Christian convictions were repeatedly attacked during his campaign by Republicans who claimed their own religious liberty was under attack. John Ossoff is a progressive Jew who also spoke extensively about the ways his political convictions were shaped by his religious commitments and anti-Semitism factored heavily into the campaign against him. Both of these candidacies revealed the presence of religion on both sides of America's political divide. That afternoon, rioters and insurrectionists stormed the US Capitol building in an act that was rife with religious rhetoric and imagery. People carrying crosses and Bibles, banners proclaiming Jesus's blessing, a prayer offered from the floor of the United States Senate. These sounds and images challenge us to recognize and come to terms with the deep and complex entanglements between Christianity and white nationalism in the United States, even as religion has also been mobilized to advance progressive causes too. This panel on religious faith and racial justice, co-sponsored by OSU's Center for Ethics and Human Values, the Center for the Study of Religion, and the Ohio Council of Churches, was organized to honor the memory and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The panel's title comes from the last book Dr. King published, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, written at a similarly turbulent time in US history. Dr. King frames his work against the backdrop of a wave of acquittals in murders against of black Americans, urban uprisings in Watts and elsewhere, white backlash against the black power movement and an escalating military conflict in Vietnam. Dr. King took this moment to reaffirm his commitment to violence, sorry, to nonviolence and multiracial solidarity as the two necessary conditions for creating community, which would keep us from descending into what he describes as chaos and violent co-annihilation. Our panelists today each carry on the mantle of this important work in different ways, and I'm very excited to engage them in conversation. So let me introduce each of them in turn, and then I'll pose an initial question to get our conversation going. Uh, to those who are attending this panel, please feel free to add questions of your own in the Q&A function, the box at the bottom of Zoom, and I will do my best to get to as many of them as I can in the short time we have. So on to our 
uh, distinguished speakers. Dr. Valerie Bridgman is Dean of the Seminary and Vice President of Academic Affairs at Methodist Theological School in Ohio, uh, in nearby Delaware, where she also is Associate Professor of Homiletics, Preaching, and Hebrew Bible. Dr. Bridgman is the founding president of a nonprofit, Women Preach, committed to training preachers who often emerge from churches, academic institutions, and other spaces that are inhospitable to their vocation and their voice. She is a peace activist and was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Collegium of Scholars and Preachers at Morehouse College in 2010. Mr. Us sorry, Mr. Usjid Hamid has worked for CARE Ohio since June of 2017. He focuses on policy, civic engagement, and outreach to empower and defend the civil rights of American Muslims in Ohio. He also served as a Puffin Democracy Fellow with the Andrew Goodman Foundation from 2018 to 2020, and was awarded the Hidden Hero Award in June 2018 for his work around voter access and civic engagement. Mr. Hamid graduated with honors from Towson University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Political Science. Rabbi Sharon Mars is the senior rabbi at Temple Israel, a reform synagogue here in Columbus, Ohio. She received her rabbinic ordination from Hebrew Union College, New York in 1998. Previously, she served as a rabbi in hospice, prisons, senior care, mental health facilities, and university settings. Rabbi Mars's rabbinate is rooted in mindfulness and social justice, and her congregation is part of a statewide campaign to set policy to combat substance use disorder and mass incarceration and to support civic engagement. Finally, the Reverend Dr. Jack Sullivan Jr. is an ordained minister in the Protestant Christian denomination known as the Christian Church Disciples of Christ US and Canada. He serves as executive director of the Columbus-based Ohio Council of Churches. A native of Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Sullivan is an internationally renowned speaker, justice advocate, ecumenist, and death penalty abolitionist. In recognition of his work to stop executions, Dr. Sullivan was given the 2020 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Social Justice by the State of Ohio's Dr. MLK Jr. Holiday Commission. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Ohio University, a Master of Divinity degree from Lexington Theological Seminary, a Doctor of Ministry from United Theological Seminary in Dayton, an honorary doctorate from Bethany College of Bethany, West Virginia, and certificates from Jackson State University and Cornell University. Dr. Sullivan was one of the co-organizers of today's event, and I want to acknowledge his assistance and support. So let me start with you, if I could, Dr. Sullivan. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Dr. King writes that the church has a special obligation it is the voice of moral and spiritual authority on earth. Yet no one observing the history of the church in America, Dr. King writes, can deny the shameful fact that it has been an accomplice in structuring racism into the architecture of American society. So I wonder to get us started, if you might speak a bit to this dual ambivalent legacy to how, why, in what ways churches and other religious institutions serve both as a voice of moral and spiritual authority, having a particular obligation perhaps to speak out, and also as accomplice to the structuring of racism in American society. Thank you, Isaac. Hello, everyone. I believe that no one comes to their faith orientations in neutral gear. We all bring to our faith whatever cultural and contextual realities that were part of the makeup of who we are. And so I believe if we brought to the faith an understanding of dominance uh, and an oppression, then we're going to find a way to weave those into the way we understand the faith. If we approach the faith from a standpoint of being hopeful for justice, uh, for, for peace, uh, for love, and I think those, those uh, attributes will shape 
how we view the faith. And so I think what has happened is that people who have had oppression in their spirits, a sense of dominance, a, a need to control others have essentially figured out ways through teaching and use of power to co-op faith and turn faith into an instrument of domination, of humiliation, of an oppression. And that accounts for the fact that we have so many people who say that they are of, of faith and that the faith has them essentially are not practicing what I would call an authentic uh, version of their faith or a credible version of their faith, but a faith that essentially has created God in their own image as opposed to them being created in God's image and functioning on God's agenda. I think the most authentic expressions uh, and credible expressions are those that stick to the text. In a Christian standpoint, that we understand Jesus uh, to have been concerned not simply about one soul as oppressive uh, faith would understand, uh, but also one's overall context, overall being, and the systems of life uh, that influence and, and, and animate uh, uh, humanity as a whole. And so interestingly, faith then would not be just about an individual, but it would project a reality that's far beyond an individual. Uh, Jesus asked us to consider uh, in our prayers, uh, focusing on the values of heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. I think then if we are looking for, for justice, looking for wholeness and for peace, then we will find those uh, attributes and more uh, embedded within our faith. And then they will give us a guidance as we build patterns of living, as we build structures for expressing our faith, and as we speak to the world beyond our very uh, own context. Thank you so much. I wonder if, if others want to um, respond to this initial question about kind of this dual legacy of religious institutions in the US before we might proceed to maybe some other more specific questions as well. Let me ask this then, I guess related. Um, speaking again, I think to this, this question of the different ways that, that religion is expressed publicly or politically in the US today. Um, Recently, many have spoken of the need for a strong, revitalized religious left in the United States to counter the power of the religious right, uh, to reclaim perhaps the mantle of religion from conservative reactionary forces. And I wonder, uh, and Rabbi Mars, maybe I could turn to you for this question first, um, what you see as the significance and force of speaking out on behalf of the religious left today? I guess, how do you understand your role as a clergy member or as a religious leader uh, to speak out on pressing political matters, uh, including racial justice, but also economic justice or sexual equality? And how might you respond to co-religionists who might suggest that matters of politics and social justice don't have a place uh, from the pulpit, let's say? Oh, I think you're still muted, Rabbi Mars. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much for, for holding this. And um, it's really prompted me to do some deep thinking about my own um, you know, place in the world, which um, you know, all good conversations about uh, race do. And when you twin it with the, um, the combination of how do we understand ourselves in the world vis-a-vis -vis faith and, and build a community that represents um, the best that we have to offer from faith, you know, can we shine a light on this question of systemic racism um, in light of Dr. King's teachings um, from a particularly enlightened, you know, we like to think perspective as religious people in the world. I see myself um, as uh, having uh, really come to appreciate in my 20 plus years in, in, as a rabbi, that there really is no true separation, as far as I'm concerned, in my own experience from politics and social justice, that's really possible. 
Um, and of course, does that mean that I, I know some folks who do try very hard as clergy to, to separate those two, um, you know, the pulpit and politics? For sure, but I think that a house of worship is the ideal place for uncomfortable conversations about moral issues. And it's the place to start sorting out what you believe, where you belong, and how you're going to behave out in the world. So I think that there's an important moral justification for us talking about politics, about um, you know, saying the words social justice, which can also be you know, very clanging in some people's heads you know, when they hear the word social injustice together. Um, and that particularly sounds a bell, I think, um, that the conversation is going to be um, sort of slanted in a particular direction. And indeed, maybe it is, but I feel like we do have an ethical obligation, no matter how people come to the conversation, um, whether it started from a place um, of an orientation toward the left or not, to articulate why it is that some actions that are taken by public officials or by police um, or by any other leaders for that matter, um, why those actions are okay or not, um, and how we as conscious creatures who have been created in the image of God need to respond um, to those uh, who may be acting um, in unethical or corrupt ways. Um, and why it is um, furthermore that we really owe it to each other as we sit in our pews um, and as we then go out into, into the streets and you know, simply on the highways together or trying to like go get um, you know, an innocuous bag of Skittles you know, and just go on our way, why it is that we need to regard each other as the full fledged human beings that God created in the world. Um, I think it's impossible to separate that. And, and for myself, I feel that um, although I try to couch so much of my uh, rabbinet in, I, I have a moral message, I know that I'm speaking politically and um, the, the goal is always to draw people in um, and not make it about left versus right, but, um, but call it out when we see that it is simply right versus wrong. Thank you. Do Dr. Bridgman, I wonder if I might invite you to uh, speak in your understanding of kind of the special role or place uh, that clergy or religious leaders might have to speak out on these matters of pressing political concern. Yeah, uh, so thank you all for uh, inviting me into this conversation. I think it's an important conversation. Uh, as an ordained person in, in the Christian church, I, I have been thinking a lot about this since I got the invitation. And I wanna start by giving you a story, which is very religious of me. Um, <laughs> Robert Louis Dabney was a Southern Presbyterian preacher who in the late 1850s and 1860s wrote a theology for slavery to bolster the Confederacy. He, um, he served the Confederacy both as a chaplain, then as chief of staff for Stonewall Jackson and on and on that story. Um, so he clearly saw the marriage between the making of the state and his theological worldview. And I think where people who, I, I, don't, I don't actually like these words left and right, but for shorthand, I'm gonna use them. People who are on the left, I think, I think the problem is that many of us are grounded in our faith and grounded in our ethics, but we don't wanna say that out loud. And so, so people on the quote right, which they rarely are, um, get to say that we are irreligious or not religious at all, that we, we have no moral worldview. The, the, from Dabney to the moral majority in the 70s to the current movement for the religious nationalist church, somebody actually just started another nationalist church by that name. Um, th there's, there's this movement uh, of concretizing really uh, a, a kind of worldview that excludes a certain group of people. 
certain group of people, women in leadership, queer folk, Muslims, Jewish people, certain Catholics, not all Catholics, but certainly Joe Biden and his kind of Catholic. Um, brown people of all ilk and all kind. And so if those of us who claim that we have a vision of the world that is, that is inspired by the divine, that is expansive, inclusive, community building, that, that is grounded in conversation and, and make, making meaning together, whether we believe the same or not, um, don't find our public voice and our public legs around that. We will always get overrun by people who believe opposite to that. And I do mean opposite, like I literally mean opposite. Having grown up in the deep South where um, my classmates used to say, save your Dixie cups, the South shall rise again. And they heard that in church and they, and somebody preached from their church pulpit that God ordained slavery, that blacks should thank God for slavery because otherwise they would have never known Christianity, which, you know, we could, we could all talk about the fact that you don't even know that Christianity started in Africa. That's a whole nother <laughs> part of that story, right? Uh, but but unless we are willing to find our our sea legs, find our voice around a moral worldview that is that is inclusive, we're always going to get outshouted and outgunned in the marketplace. And so I think, as somebody who trains leaders who are going to take pulpits, and as somebody who's been preaching now for forty plus years. We have to. I mean, it's 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 an imperative. Uh, last thing I want to say about that is I was thinking also about how uh, people always say the things you shouldn't talk about are religion. If you want to have a nice dinner, you shouldn't talk about religion. You shouldn't talk about politics, and you shouldn't talk about money. And this morning, it occurred to me that that's because all of those are leaning into our idolatries. And, and uh, I'm also happy to uh, just to chime in as well. I think it's critical for religious leaders to talk about issues of social justice in their houses of worship for two reasons. Um, number one is that doing so helps to educate those that may not be aware. And number two, uh, it helps to mobilize individuals that may want to do something about those issues. We were sort of talking before we went live here that there are, are large segments of the population which um, uh, do not believe uh, in facts, basically. And their worldview is derived uh, from conspiracy theories. And, and um, that presents a serious challenge when you try to build bridges, that it's, you know, it is one thing to look at a set of facts and come to two different conclusions, uh, but it's, a, it's an entirely different story when there are two sets of facts. Uh, and so that task becomes much more difficult. And so I think that religious leaders um, have a certain level of credibility to them and respect. And so uh, many of these individuals who, um, uh, you know, uh, do not believe in certain facts, you know, can be worshiping right alongside us. And so it's, it's critical for us to have those conversations you know, whether it be about, you know, voting rights or police brutality or, you know, whatever social issue, you know, uh, maybe sort of dominating the day or the week that, uh, you know, we are called to do something about this. And so, you know, these are the facts on the ground. This is what is going on in our society. And so folks who may be getting their facts from a place that is not credible, you know, that may help them sort of begin to, you know, think, okay, you know, uh, what is really going on and what is my place in, you know, uh, in the world. 
I think a lot of times, and I'm sure other people can agree, you know, sort of regardless of your religion, that we all know individuals that, um, you know, will go to their house of worship, go to mosque, or, uh, or, or to their church or to their synagogue, and then sort of that's it. And so that's, like, that's all they do. There is no sort of service aspect. There is no uh, community involvement aspect. And so certainly sort of worship and prayer is important, but uh, at least in Islam, we are, we are taught by our prophet, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, that it's important for us to tie our camel as well. And that, and, and that we must also be um, sort of actively uh, 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 working to, to sort of address our issues along with um, praying and um, having that relationship with God. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask each of you, um, as leaders in particular religious communities who are also here today engaged in a form of interfaith conversation, uh, there's two kind of related questions, which is one, um, many accounts of the civil rights movement, for example, often emphasize its ecumenical, interracial, interreligious character. And I wonder what you see as the significance or the importance of forming interfaith or multi-faith coalitions around as part of the struggle for racial justice. And relatedly, I also wonder if each of you thinking about your own religious communities, uh, how you balance the imperative on the one hand to confront matters of racial injustice within your own religious communities, uh, within American Muslim community or American Jewish community or American Christianity, and how you speak uh, more broadly to kind of questions of racial justice in society writ large. Um, so yeah, so I see how you think about those kind of those those dual roles of speaking kind of internally to your community and also thinking largely of your community as a part of a larger national community. I think when we work ecumenically and through interfaith networks, uh, at at once we realize that we can accomplish far more together uh, than any of us could ever accomplish by ourselves. And as a Christian, the ecumenical community uh, makes the church stronger, but working together as church bodies makes the church stronger as a whole. Yet when we work with people of other faith orientations and groups, that kind of work makes our community stronger. And I think gives us a collective sense of credibility uh, to a, a community that may not, or that may be skeptical of faith to begin with, when they see us on the same team and the team for human wholeness and for justice rooted in love, then I think we all gain a sense of credibility uh, from society around us. Now concerning issues that are dom domestic, if you will, to one's own faith group, I'm a part of a mostly white denomination or ordained in that church and I'm fourth generation in that church. And yet, uh, uh, that has not made me immune to the reality that racism and oppression have lived and do live within the structures of my denomination. Even as I'm speaking to the, those issues that are affecting society as a whole. And so uh, I have found it to be important, gravely so, to speak the truth with power and to power, not just in society as a, as a whole, which I do, but also to my own faith group, my own church body, and, and say, how can we condemn uh, the brokenness and the sinfulness uh, in society around us uh, without confronting that which is within our very bodies at the same time? We have to do both. We have to speak to our internal woes and the external woes at the same time. And I know I'm preaching to the choir because of, you know, having fellow clergy here, but, you know, we are often asked to wear many hats. And um, that means like having to multitask. And if the past is any kind of teacher for us, it's um, that when we reflect, you know, as the Jewish community in the Jewish American community, I think there's um, a great bit of, um, pride and nostalgia for having, uh, you know, the, the image of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with Dr. King. 
um, is, is one that's really burned into to the, to our memories. And that's the example, I think, of how necessary it is to show up for each other um, as people of faith, as people of different skin tones and um, ideas about the intersection of faith and God and government. Um, and to show up with humility. And, and I think that the power is still there today, even if we have to adjust it in some ways for obviously the current situation, but the, um, there's, there's so much demand calling us from without. And, and for in that, in that realm, we need to be able to kind of take from our shared hymnal, if you will, our vocabulary that we sing together um, as, as communities of faith, you know, because we actually have um, this story that, you know, we can all share about crossing a perilous divide and getting to the other side with freedom and redemption on our lips and hope. And if we are going to share that lexicon, um, it, it can only be good, as, as Dr. Sullivan just articulated. Um, at the same time, I think that what I what I worry about is when, not if, um, at least coming from um, the Jewish community perspective, when we have great um, moments of insecurity and um, and violence um, in in the Jewish world today, all we have to do is say Charlottesville or Pittsburgh or Poway. And that's become code for how vulnerable we feel. So I think that everybody, it's safe to say, we all go into our, we shrink back into our own communities and want to take solace and get se feeling secure from within. Um, and that's the time that, um, you know, my, my congregants can expect to hear simply about, you know, what's happening and how do we, how do we do okay for ourselves? And when we start being able to emerge again, feeling a little bit safer, um, you know, in light of all the anti-Semitism that is, you know, really very inextricably linked to the greater xenophobia and racism and, and, and so on in the world. Um, by the time we kind of come back out of, of that place, um, we have to be ready to sort of be nimble and adept at absorbing what, what else is going on in the world. So I think we're, we're dancing in two places at once. And that is just part of the character of, I think, uh, faith in America these days is tr trying to be all things for everyone. But the trick is to do it really well so that we can feel supported from without and from within. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here and say um, part of what Rabbi Mars, what you reminded me of is, is King in the kitchen where he had to make peace with death. And um, yesterday, as I was, I was talking to my counselor who asked me whether I felt safe and the answer to that is no, I live in the USA and I'm a black woman and I'm in central Ohio and right around the corner from me, literally right around the corner from me, there was a rally with uh, flags flying that included the Confederacy flag, and, you know, and whatever. So, so if if safety can't be the thing that holds me in place to do the work, what then do I have? Uh, it becomes the question. And for me, as I said to her yesterday, it's like one of the things that King said, and one of the things my father used to say, who was also a Christian preacher, he was a holiness preacher, said, you have to be, there has to be something you're willing to die for. You don't have to go looking for death. I promise you, it will come find you. But you, if you shrink back because it's dangerous all the time, we're never going to get anything done, which I don't, I didn't hear you saying that. That's not what I'm saying, but this is what it made me think about is that I, I navigate the world knowing it's not safe. And some of it is not safe because of really toxic theology. And uh, to, to the question about how do you speak to Christianity, I said before we came on camera that uh, I, I can't even draw a Venn diagram between me and certain people who's, who claim to be Christian as I claim to be Christian. But there's no overlap in our theology. The only overlap we have is that we are human. And so 
which makes me think of what my dear friend in Austin, Jim Rigby says, when, you're, when your faith gets in the way, throw it away and go for humanity. And he doesn't by that mean don't live out your faith. He, just, he simply means, and, and I agree with this, is that sometimes our, we use our faith as a barrier to this community that we all want. We use what we most cherish, what we most truly believe as a reason for not being in relationship with other people as opposed to, as the Buddha says, if, if you come upon Buddha and you're going to plant a tree, kill the Buddha, plant the tree. You know, it's like do the thing that makes for good humanity, uh, even even if it means you got to go figure out your theology afterwards. Um, I I guess just to just to uh, also add on to that. I mean, I think um, I think to answer this question, I guess from a tactical perspective. The importance of interfaith coalitions and, and, and interracial coalitions is that it helps you increase your tent. It helps you increase the number of people that are looped in about your efforts to um, bring about equity. You know, it's sort of, um, I think that if you look through American history, uh, you know, a number of people have faced this, uh, all sorts of challenges. And so really through, um, you know, coalition building um, that has been a sort of a central a, a central tenant excuse me of helping to um, address those inequities and it's also important because um, you know sort of as all of us on this panel you know are, are are members of you know marginalized communities and 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 we certainly continue to face challenges to this day but it's important that we be there for one another um, so you know uh, you know, uh, in, for example, in response to the horrendous uh, Pittsburgh uh, uh, shooting, you know, uh, the the Muslim community, you know, we sort of work to work to do our part to be there alongside our Jewish brothers and sisters. And so I know that in the wake of uh, incidents of violence against Muslims, our Jewish brothers and sisters have been been there for us. And so that's something that's just really important is just being there for one another as we face challenges. Thank you. So I'm looking, there's a few questions that have come in from the audience. And the, the first question that came in is one that asks about if there are a common core of values we might identify that are kind of shared across these traditions. And if I could take a little bit of liberty, I might um, add a little bit more to this question. Uh, thinking again uh, with uh, the book by Dr. King, from which the title of this panel comes, uh, Where Do We Go From Here? Um, where, it's in, in response, addressing this question, I guess, of what are the values that we share, uh, King actually describes, perhaps not surprisingly, love, as in his words, the force which all the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. And yet earlier in the work, I think he writes powerfully, he says that the white liberal must see that black Americans need not only love, but also justice. And I wonder if you might, Itra, invite any of you to, to speak a little bit to how you understand this relationship between love and justice uh, as values that seem to undergird um, many religious traditions, and yet I think call on us to act in very different ways in the world. Uh, and so I wonder if any of you might speak to this relationship at all that, that King lays out between love and justice. So I'll go first because we're all sitting here going, I don't want to go first. <laughs> um, you know, Cornell West riffing off of King says justice is what love looks like in public, right? So Cornell West, uh, if you don't know who he is, Google him. Um, <laughs> but but what, I, what that made me think of uh, following what, what um, what she said is that showing up for one another in a very particular way is in fact a love act. Like it, it, it isn't, and King would say this, 
love is not gooey. It's not that, ooh, I, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it is rigorous. It doesn't even require me to like you. It requires me to love your humanity, to want you to survive, to want you to thrive, to want you to be okay, like I want myself to be okay. So to quote a quote a uh, you know the Christian love it uh, or or actually also in the Jewish law, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? It's like what does it mean to love yourself? What does right things look like? That's what you want for your neighbor. And so th this kind of, I'll, I'll talk about public health concerns. It makes no sense to me that we don't have unified public health for everybody. It just makes no sense to me because we all want to be well. It's like, it's really possible. People do it all over the world. But because we have somehow made goods, uh, uh, believed in a limited good, as opposed to the common good, we don't get that done. And that to me is not loving to in a culture. That's just my example of that. I don't know if that answers your question. I would just add to that, uh, Dr. Bridgman, uh, Christian teachings point out that if we say that we love God, but we hate a sister or a brother, we are liars. We are not telling the truth. And so we have this overarching commandment throughout the text, biblical text, that we are to be people who love and who channel God's love uh, to the world around us. I've often believed that while you can work for justice and not love, I don't think you can love and not be about the work for justice. And to me, I, I think um, that's where we ought to have conversations in, in our various faith groups, and particularly mine, the church, uh, because very often love is the marshmallowy, mushy stuff that we all like to watch on Hallmark movies and those kind of uh, uh, forums. And I like those, but I would say love is certainly beyond the mushiness and the sentimentality. It is action. It is sometimes gritty, sometimes dirty, some, sometimes um, not recognizable at first. And yet there it is working in the trenches uh, to break the chains of oppression, to shatter unjust policies, uh, to point toward a vision of wholeness, of justice rooted in love. Um, that's, that's what love calls us to do. That's what we're called to do, I should say, as people of faith. Uh, that is from my Christian standpoint. And I think all of our faith groups have similar orientations to what love is and what love calls us to do and equips us to do. Um, one of my professors from my doctoral program, the late Samuel DeWitt Proctor, would say that we ought to live in a subjunctive mood where we're not imprisoned by life the way it is, but liberated by life the way it may be. I think love liberates us to the vision of how life may be and gives us the energy to pursue it with all that we've got. I think that, um... I think just to add on to what has been said in, in Islam, sort of love and justice are, are absolutely important. You know, Muslims um, believe that it's important for us to speak out uh, against injustice, even if it be against ourselves. And so that absolutely is sort of a thread that, that is very, very prevalent uh, in Islam. But I think that that, I think this conversation sort of, I think really goes back to your earlier question about the importance of religious leaders um, in this discussion and sort of what is the difference between love and justice. I think of um, sort of in the summer in the wake of the tragic George Floyd killing, for example, we saw that Black Lives Matter, at least uh, polling showed, uh, reach sort of new heights in the American population. And you had all these people coming out and saying Black Lives Matter. But as we've seen, 
you know, it is one thing to say it and one thing to sort of think that you believe it, but it's another thing to actually act in accordance with the movement. And so just if we look at, for example, how, how certain people have viewed the storming of the Capitol, I, you know, I think that um, it's pretty clear that had those people not been white, had they been black, had they been Muslim, for example, it would have been a completely different story. And so that I think points to um, sort of, I think uh, what the Black Lives Matter movement speaks about, but but we're still very divided on that. And so, yeah, it's just it is it is a um, it's a critical conversation. But I think people need to be upfront with one another and say that um, there is a difference between you know I think love and justice because you know people perceive love as 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 sort of um, disconnected from justice. I think, and so we need to have those conversations. And, and I think there's such really critical, difficult conversations and, um, and that they involve not just our turning to, um, you know, as a white person to a black friend and saying, explain to me everything that you suffer from. No, this is, this is about me turning to my white Jewish family and saying, let's talk about racism and let's talk about love and justice and how does that, how, you know, these are, these are two words that I think that we take for granted, but they're really two sides of the same coin. Um, and you really can't have fully one without the other, as you've said. Um, I, I, uh, I love a, a quote from uh, Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, who, um, who said that uh, love uh, without justice is whipped cream on garbage. I mean, that's poetry right there. But that is, I think, something really, you know, that we can't, we just can't um, love our neighbors, you know, um, as we love ourselves. We have to love our neighbors the way they want to be loved. And this is so critical to you love your neighbor in a way that that person recognizes, is recognized uh, for their inherent dignity and worth. And, um, and that's why it's not a mistake that in the same place in Leviticus, where it calls on us to love our neighbor, um, it's juxtaposed with the text, do not bear false witness, false witness, treat your workers fairly, and do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. So we don't, we don't you know, we can always take things out of context, but the, the real context for our moment is that there is so much suffering um, that has been imposed because of the, you know, the, the myriad problems, social problems um, that really come down to, in so many ways, the problem of black and white in this country um, that has not been fully worked through in, in really honest conversations, starting at home and then emanating, I think, outwards, where we can have trusting relationships, as, as I think we're starting to, you know, um, to show here, you know, if we can have conversations like this, then love and justice, I think, is much more possible and slow, <laughs> slow to get, but worth it. So I think this, this speaks to another question we've received from the audience, which is a question from uh, Professor Gregory Hitsusen of Ohio State. And he writes, thank you for so many profound insights. This is a crucial conversation. My question is simply to ask about how our panelists have seen congregations as places for political and racial reconciliation. Many congregations, as you've noted, have both liberal and conservative members and also can have diverse racial membership while being a community of common faith. How have you seen that play out? Can you speak to examples of when congregational diversity has been a site for positive dialogue and action? Yeah, I'm gonna go first again. Hi, Greg. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I will just say I pastored for many years in Austin, a multiracial, a deliberately multiracial congregation, non-denominational, although we were affiliated with the Church of God Anderson at the time. Um, and we had lots of opportunities to, uh, to where these, where racism butted its head up against the theology, the treatment of one another, 
you know, where we, I just, I literally just was telling somebody this, where we had a lot of conversations with parents around the fact that their children, because they were being raised in this congregation under black leadership, were going to end up marrying black and brown folk. And they need to be talking about that right this moment. And what would that mean where we sent people out to do advocacy work and activist work, the whole nine yards. And, and it would, it, bumped up against a lot of people's upbringings. You know, we were in Texas. It, 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 it bumped up against their theology, what they grew up believing and whatever. But this is where leaders have to get really, really clear. So I often say to my students, if your congregation does not know where you stand, they can't even stand in opposition to you. You know, it's like if you if you're a jellyfish, they they won't know what the stance is, and then therefore they don't even know what the con conversation is. So I, I think that our ability at that time to create space for con conversation and conflict, conflict where people could then be reconciled to one another, and not just walk away uh, from one another, uh, really helped that congregation grow. And out of that congregation came several pastors who kind of kept that going in their own congregations. Again, we always, I have always married activism to faith because I don't think they're one with, I don't think, I don't, they're not separate things for me. So I, I repeated that thing when I took the pastorate in Memphis. I've been pastor since Memphis, but if you, you're not clear about where you stand so that people don't know what the conversation is, you, you can't create a community where conversation can happen and where transformation can happen and where Asjid, people can put their feet on the ground and, and test what you're saying, right? Because if you don't say anything, they just come to pray and go home and and separate that out from the rest of their world. And for me, we always said, no, your faith is where you live, work, and play. Here's where we come to get encouraged, strengthened, renewed, but this is not where you live out your faith. This is not even where you test your faith. This is just where you get to question your faith and think about your faith and be assured in your faith or challenged by your faith but it's not where you live it out. I think that um, there are many mosques in America that are quite diverse um, racially. So, you know, you have Muslims in America that, you know, are from um, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, India, Kenya, Somalia, you know, you name it. And so you have these people from all over the world um, that will many times um, you know, pray in the same mosque. And so that's, that's always been something really cool for me is just to walk into a mosque and see all these people just from all these different countries um, praying together. Uh, and so I do think that, um, I think that especially in the wake of the George Floyd killing, I think that um, mosques at least are being more intentional about having conversations around race and diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, and so um, I think that, you know, you like you, you will have certain mosques, for example, which will which will reserve a certain number of seats for people from, you know, X country to make sure that they get representation on the board. And so I think that that is certainly a step in the right direction. But, you know, um, there's always more work to be done. But I will say that in the wake, again, of sort of what happened over the summer and uh, the protests around Black Lives Matter, you do have more mosques that, you know, are not just sort of content with the fact that their congregations are diverse. Now they're taking it one step further and, and, and having conversations around um, inclusion and equity. I think we have to resolve within ourselves the question, are we ambassadors of societal transformation or ambassadors of personal comfort or maintenance. Much of Christianity has been about the latter, personal comfort and societal maintenance. And yet when I read the text, 
And when I remember my sense of call to ministry and my faith orientation that goes back to the historic black church, America's most authentic freedom organization. Uh, when I think about all of that, uh, that catapulted me into giving leadership uh, in a church I served in the middle of Trump country, beginning a pastorate there shortly after his inauguration. I was catapulted into preaching not against Trump, but for love and for the vision of what we can be if we are ambassadors together of the love that we sing about in our faith. And so I preached what I would call challenging sermons every week in that context, but I didn't put down anybody, didn't have to, to lift up the ethic of love justice that comes from our faith in a Christian standpoint. And so um, I think I had to be what I would say it true to my sense of call, my understanding of who I was in that context, who I was overall, and then trust God enough to live on it, to preach it and to teach it. This context had a person who came to me once after Bible study in this 99% white church, came to me and said, Reverend, this is the first time I understood my faith to mean justice. And I've been a Bible student for 40 years. And I thought, well, I'm glad that we could talk about justice today and now you have a broader perspective about what your faith means. But think about it. So many people in, in churches around the country have had no idea that their faith involves the work for justice. I think more, more of us have to be willing to take the risk of being honest and truthful about who we are as ages of change and the biblical text and then preach and teach accordingly not against anybody, but for love, but for justice. So with an eye on the clock and knowing that our time together is, is sadly uh, dwindling, I wanted to maybe um, pose two more related questions that might bring us to a bit of a conclusion, knowing that there's obviously always much more to discuss and that I hope we will continue to discuss around these issues. Um, and they're related. I guess it's that a, a, a few of you have made references to what felt like kind of a palpable change over this past summer. Uh, that I know when the Black Lives Matter movement first emerged five or six years ago, following uh, the shooting of Michael Brown in, in Ferguson, Missouri, there was a lot of media attention that portrayed the movement as far more secular or spiritually heterogeneous, perhaps, when compared to prior iterations of civil rights movements, whether, whether this is a mistaken impression or not. Um, and many of us would think that it is mistaken, uh, but a perception at least that many of its leaders in the streets were frustrated by the relative inattention of churches and other religious institutions to questions and matters of racial justice. And I guess my question is not just, do you think this is fair? Have you seen evidence of this in Ohio? Is this accurate? But also for those people in the pews, laity, let's say, who might feel frustrated um, either by their clergy or leaders lack of attention to these issues or in those congregations that have paid attention in the last six months, but perhaps they're not sure, will that last, will that endure? Um, what can non-clergy, non-leaders, laity folk do to hold their leaders accountable to make sure this is not a short-lived moment, uh, but that attention to these matters endures beyond this moment? Um, and related to that, there have been questions in the audience and I would add as well, uh, what can folks here in Ohio do next? What are the next steps? How can people get involved to support these efforts? Um, and what do you see as the most productive or fruitful uh, steps or paths that folks can take next? Well, um, I didn't wanna step on Reverend Sullivan's beautiful words of, um, you know, that he was preaching before. So I just let that go, the last question. And, and, I'm, and I'll just say that, you know, we have a lot of work to do as Ushjit also just said. Um, I, I think from, from my perspective um, and, and the Jewish community is, um, I think really um, very conscious of how do we lend our voice in a very, a very tactical um, way to support Black Lives Matter. 
Um, and, and I think that has changed that conversation. I think the summer changed everything in terms of how uh, BLM has has um, become so much more part of our uh, just the you know the the dinner table conversation, um, and and um, much less polarizing from where I sit as a as a rabbi at a reform congregation. Um, it has, if anything, um, I'll just say it has uh, made our um, Impair, the, made the imperative much clearer that we have to show up um, and practice deep listening, but also um, I'd say that there is uh, a need for us to um, let this moment harness the opportunity to explode the myth that all Black people are one way, that all Jews look one way, that all Muslims are one way. There is like this conversation that really has there's, there's a, a term that I just learned, which is Ashkenormativity, normativity, which means that, you know, we can't just default to all Jews looking like Ashkenazic white Jews. You know, there are all different. This has, this has happened as a result, I think, of, of um, this conversation. And, and I don't think, and, and of the protests this summer. Um, so I think it has brought it much more to, into um, the lexicon of, of who we are as a, as a um, in Ohio, um, I, I do think that it's um, important for us to now determine how we, especially as part of the faith community, are going to hold our leaders accountable. Um, and, and I'll say one positive thing, which is that even um, I think just tomorrow, there's a, a group of uh, Inter interfaith leaders um, that are going to be speaking to um, to we're going to we're planning to speak to Mayor Ginther and to Sheriff Baldwin about um, how it is that the the, the deaths of um, Casey Goodson Jr. and Andre Hill have still not received the attention that they need to um, and I think it's these coalitions that um, really kind of have to hold. Um, our elected officials feet to the fire and um, not make it that it, you know, it can't be just a reference to the summer of 2020 and that's it. You know, there's really a responsibility and accountability that has to um, come alongside of it. Stop talking. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Barbara Holmes wrote a book called Race and the Cosmos, in which she argued that a lot of times the reason we don't do this work long distance, long, you know, over the long haul is because we, we perceive it as, as uh, tele teleological, like it's going to end immediately or soon, like it's on a progression, and one day we're going to get to it and whatever, as opposed to being a long-term ongoing contraction, protraction, you know, the way the universe, the way the cosmos works, it, it falls in, it expands, it falls in, expands. So, you know, we, we if, if you see the work that, that way, or as my mother would, would have said it this way, if you see it as a bumpy road instead of just a bump in the road, you'll be okay. You know, it's like, because then you're ready for the bumps, right? Um, so I, I think some of it is recalibrating what we expect. This is, this is hard work. It's hard work because humans are, are slow to change and because we are afraid and because we're afraid of giving up. We, we think only, I, I say to my students all the time, we think only about what we're losing, never about what we're gaining. And so because of that, it's hard for us to let go of our worldview, the way we think, the way the people we work with, we, we get to a certain age, we don't even want to meet new people, right? So it, it's like, oh, I got, my, I got my circle of friends. And so some of it is, 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 is pressing ourselves to even talk to our leaders. A lot of times people say, well, the leaders don't want to, they may not even know in your, not me, but they may not know that that's the conversation that this congregation wants to have. 
you know, they are human too. They, they have, they have frailties as well. And so, so the, I think it's a combination of, of um, uh, agreeing to the bumpiness of it all and, and committing to the long haul of it all. Dr. Valerie, I, I really appreciate what you said about the, the bumpy road. That reminds me of the, uh, the Coretta Scott King quote about freedom never being really won. It must be you know, won again every, every generation. And that is just so, so true. Um, I think in terms of what lay people can do, um, again, I can only sort of speak from, I guess, my experience um, as someone that interfaces with mosques. Um, but I mean, I'm sure this, I'm sure that the structure is similar across other houses of worship. You know, if you want to um, sort of have your voice heard, I think it's important to join, you know, committees uh, or, uh, you know, different, different sorts of boards. You know, I know certain, you know, houses of worship will have youth boards and so things like that. And so I think that, um, you know, leaders really appreciate young people and, and, well, and, just, and just sort of people in general that have ideas and enthusiasm and that, and that want to do things. And so I think that that is sort of the easiest thing you can do is just sort of join a committee and, and, and put forth ideas. Um, because again, I think, I think, I think people appreciate other people that are passionate about things and that have a certain fire inside them. I think that speaks to something deep inside us as human beings. I think that we find that inherently optimistic. Um, and I think in terms of what we can do moving forward, I mean, obviously the number one thing is to vote, but that's sort of the minimum. I think sort of in the wake of, you know, the past few years and what we've seen, I've developed a deep appreciation for just sort of being able to, um, you know, touch people just sort of, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Like I think um, myself as an activist, I was so concerned with, you know, transformational change at one point. Um, but I think, you know, even, you know, even volunteering in our communities to be able to touch one life at a time or, you know, donating to our local charity. I mean, that is, you know, helping to feed a hungry person uh, has impact. Helping to, you know, uh, uh, give a family that um, is in need uh, new clothes or shoes or school supplies, that, that has impact. And so I think that's certainly while we're looking at a lot of the things that may not be, um, you know, uh, very, very, a positive in the macro, I think that in the micro, we can we can really still continue to have an impact on our communities. I think a lot of churches are waking up to the reality that um, comfort Christianity, maintenance Christianity, that they thought would preserve their denominational lives uh, has not worked. And churches have still shrunk over the last few decades as they were invested in being uh, comfortable and maintaining uh, a, a way of life. And I think uh, many churches now have awakened to um, the understanding that faith involves love, it involves risk, it involves showing up and trusting God with one's life and one's future. Turns out being church is sharply more spiritual than um, that people gave it credit for being. We, we pray and we depend on God for vision, for energy, and we trust God, not always knowing how, what the outcome of our activities will be. So that means uh, we, we've got to be willing to show up and do something with our faith, make some new partnerships within church bodies and beyond them. The most exciting ones tend to be interfaith partnerships these days, and I believe that's where our real hope comes um, when we have numbers that are bigger than our own that point to reality that's beyond ourselves. I was in Terre Haute last week protesting uh, execution at the Federal Correctional Institute there uh, that President Trump and Attorney General of the past, Bill Barr, put in, in motion. And uh, we had Operation Warp Speed for the vaccine and also for executions in our last year. And I was there with an interfaith group. There were Christians there, there were Jews there, there was a Muslim there. And we made a witness at the prison there that we were against executions. It was cold every night that we were there, yet there we were. 
I believe we have to take the risk of showing up, even when it's not something that is comfortable for us. Do it anyway, because it's right. And it sends the right message, sets the right tone for how life could be if we insisted so. Thank you, and I'm, I'm sorry that we are out of time and to cut short this rich conversation. But let me thank each of you for showing up, um, as Dr. Sullivan said, and for doing uh, this important work, both the work in the community and the work here of engaging us. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Ethics and Human Values and the Center for the Study of Religion, I'm just so grateful to each of you for being part of this conversation. And I know that uh, both of these centers hope that in the future we'll have more efforts to engage local communities here in Ohio around these critically important issues and questions. Uh, to the audience, thank you for being a part of this. Uh, and I hope that all of us go out and continue to show up as you've all encouraged us to do. So thank you very much. <laughs>